I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome to this special edition of the Sky News Daily, where we will be looking back at what happened in international affairs in 2023. China, the United States, the war in Ukraine, and of course that war in the Middle East. All of these have shaped the past 12 months and will certainly shape the months to come in 2024. Uh, back to give us uh, the benefit of their expertise, our defence and security analyst, uh, Professor Michael Clark, also Dominic Wycorn, Sky's international affairs editor. Chaps, always lovely to see you. Um, and I suppose, Dominic, we, we probably should start with that piece of international affairs, that piece of geopolitics that is occupying everyone right now. Take us back to October the 7th. And just walk us through what happened in Israel on that day and indeed why it was allowed to happen. Yeah, well, day. I think we're still trying to get the answer to the last question. Mm. But in terms of what happened, and it's very important that we start with that, I think, because that's kind of set the stage for what's happened since and will for, for next year, certainly in, in the region. And what happened on that day was an attack uh, on the scale of which and the barbarity of which we've just not seen it is Israel, really, ever, ever in its entire history, and probably not really anywhere else quite like that, where um, Hamas managed to get out of Gaza. They breached the security fence that the Israelis built, a uh, high-tech, multi-million uh, dollar fence that they thought was pretty much impregnable. But they managed to get through, I think, in 29 places, and then they went on a killing... A massacring uh, spree. Were it was, they... was a massacre, wasn't it? I mean, we should we should be absolutely we should be absolutely straightforward about the barbarity that Absolutely. we saw on that day. Yeah, it was the worst attack, uh, the worst, the highest number of Jews killed since the Holocaust. Um, a music festival attacked uh, where hundreds of young people have been celebrating music and peace were attacked, gunned down, chased. Uh, they were killed in cold blood, dragged out of, dragged out of cars, drug, dragged out of bus shelters and killed in cold blood. They were raped. Um, the reports of the rapes are, are harrowing. They weren't just raped mm. but women, they were disfigured. Um, and then in the kibbutzes further north, uh, Hamas gunmen, but also a number of other gunmen who, who got out of fighters who got out of Gaza, um, went on a killing spree, burning down kibbutzes, burning down homes and rounding up Jewish families at gunpoint and dragging them off into captivity. It's something that's happened to Jews throughout their history, it's something that, that sort of struck at the very heart of the Jewish uh, psyche. So it was inevitable that we saw the kind of reaction we saw from Israel, just not just in terms of revenge, retribution for what happened, but also to try and address what had happened to their deterrence, something I think that caused a lot of concern elsewhere beyond Israel, that Israel had been seen to be humiliated, and, and that was a, a threat to regional stability as well as to Israel. Michael, walk us through the response that, that, that Dominic was just alluding to there. It has been brutal. It has been bloody. So the death toll continues to rise and we should mention to, to listeners and viewers that of course we are we're recording this before Christmas so so things may well have changed even in in the short time yeah. between this and and the podcast being published mm. but but whilst it was to be expected that there was an Israeli response did we did we think it was going to be as it has been yes mm. for, and for two sort of reasons one is that internally as Dom said I mean this attack was uniquely brutal and shocking and it destroyed something inside Israel, that, that idea that Israel has always embodied, that if you're a Jew in the world who feels pressured, come to Israel and you will be safe. We will keep you safe. And Netanyahu's policies over most of the last 20 years have been based on the idea that we, don't, we, we really don't need to talk too much to the Palestinians. They're a nuisance. We can live with the problem. You will be safe in Israel. And it completely destroyed that. So it destroyed that fundamental sort of assumption of the Israeli state, and it destroyed um, Netanyahu's policies. His policies were in tatters now as a result of that attack. That's the first aspect. So, so don't underestimate the effect this is having on Israeli society in the longer term, or will have. The second thing is that because of the attack, we will not live with, with Hamas anymore. We will not live next door to these people. I'm not even sure they are saying we can live with Palestinians anymore. And the degree of intercommunal tension which now exists. I mean, you know, twenty percent of Israel's population is Arab. If you include the the occupied territories, forty percent of Israel's population that they're responsible is Arab, and both sides are saying we can't live next to each other anymore. And that has dictated this sense that we will destroy Hamas, and that's what they did. I mean, Israel declared war the day after. Uh, this attack. They invoked Article 40 of the Constitution, which allows them to declare war, call it reservists. And having declared war, 
the Israeli cabinet, for all sorts of political reasons, has no idea what comes next, yeah. other than we destroy Hamas. And that's where we are this Christmas, that this pr process of destroying Hamas is ongoing, but still, still, Israel has no idea how it's going to reconcile its own internal Palestinian population or how it's going to live next to 2.3 million Palestinians on, in Gaza and 2.8 million, million Palestinians on the West Bank. I mean, Dom, you, you're, you're recently returned. So just talk to us a little bit about the difficulties of knowing what exactly is going on inside Gaza, because as things stand, yeah. plus we would like to be in there, we cannot. So we're relying on local journalists and fixers for a lot of the information. And I suppose that, that, that is playing into the information battle that, that we have seen, the back and forth, which, which perhaps was most, most, most obvious when it came to Al-Shifa Hospital. Yeah, I mean, it has, there has been a, an extraordinarily ferocious information war. Um, and uh, I think because Israelis felt this was an existential uh, threat to them. They and have, understandably so. Yeah, they, they have responded in a kind of appropriate uh, manner. In some ways, it's been hysterical and quite shrill, their response. And from the Palestinians, from Hamas, we've seen extraordinary misinformation. Um, but the bottom line for us as journalists is we can't get into Gaza. International journalists can't get in. The only journalists in there now are those who were there when it happened. And this time round, there weren't many uh, people from outside Gaza who weren't already based there um, who were in there. So it's been very hard to peer in at this war and work out exactly what's going on. We have very brave teams uh, in there who've been sending us pictures back, as have other uh, organisations. The Israelis um, and the Egyptians have barred access to, to the media any other people going in, they haven't really come up with a decent excuse apart from to say, well, why would you want to go in? To which we obviously say, well, <laughs> we'll, we'll take the risk. So when, when it comes to what is happening on the ground, to what extent are we still reduced to saying, here is what the Israelis is claiming on this particular occasion, here is what the authorities in Gaza are, are claiming. I mean, are, are we able to, to, to more, well, to independently verify more of what is going on on the ground than, than perhaps we were in the early stages of this conflict? There's a row about the death toll. The health ministry in, in Gaza is run by Hamas, and so the Israelis say their numbers can't be trusted. But actually, after all the conflicts that we've had, the numbers that Hamas run, uh, health ministry figures come up with, are pretty much corroborated by what international organisations uh, come up with as well. So you have to kind of piece it together. You've got to kind of put, uh, you have to triage the information. And obviously, it's very important that we get it as right as we can. And, and, and of course, Michael, what, we, what has been particularly noteworthy to me in, in the past few weeks is the way in which the criticism of Israel has escalated, and not just from the usual suspects. Meeting of the Security Council the other day, the UK's ambassador to the United Nations made it very, very clear she was not happy with the way in which Israel is prosecuting this war. No. If it is done, then when it is done, to, well, it were done quickly. That's Indeed. what Macbeth said. If you're going to do something dreadful, do it quickly. You know, you've Israeli... obviously jinxed us all now by mentioning <laughs> Scottish oh, this is the studio. It's not the stage. Right, all right. You enough. don't have to go around and turn three times outside the door. Uh, no, the, um, if you're going to do something dreadful, do it quickly. And the IDF knew that they would have to try to do this operation quickly, the Israeli Defence Forces, but they also knew they probably couldn't. And so they're, they're, they're stuck. They know that the amount of time that the world will give them for this is limited, that the outrage, and right outrage, the outrage of October the 7th, and we shouldn't forget, as Dominic said, the sheer brutality of that. And it was intended to shock the world. It was intended to be shocking, and it was. Um, and as that fades over the months... So the death toll in Gaza and the inevitable consequences of this sort of war among 2.3 2 million people, where you're trying to pick out 25 to 30,000 Hamas people in a population of 2.3 million, mm. a population of men of eligible age of about 600,000 who might belong to Hamas, of the right age and gender to belong to Hamas. And you're trying to find 30,000 among those 600,000. That is always going to be a brutal process. And they know that the world will keep on turning against them and at the moment, they're caught because this, this operation cannot be conducted completely except with more time to spare, and they don't have it. I, su I suppose, though, the, the one difference between what is taking place in the Middle East and, indeed, what is happening on the eastern frontier of Europe, our next topic, Ukraine, is that people are, are, are openly discussing what happens when the violence ends mm. in Gaza. We're, we're not quite at that point yet, are we, when it comes to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, are we, Don? Uh, I don't think we are. No, and I think um, we're now looking at, um, we're looking back over a year of wasted opportunities, squandered opportunities. There was a, there was a moment where had the Ukrainians been given the tanks, um, the wherewithal 
uh, to strike at the Russians and expel them. They might have had a chance of doing so before the Russians had dug in this that Surovikin line, this uh, this sort of um, extraordinary defensive line they've built for a thousand miles along the front through uh, the front line through. Ukraine, but but while the arguments were going on between the Germans, the Americans, about and, and other allies as to what kind of tanks and how many tanks they could get, the Russians were digging in, and they've proved now impregnable in that in that position, and the Ukrainian counteroffensive has effectively failed. So I think the advice that they are now being given by the Americans is they need to hold and build. I think is mm. is the term. So they need to dig in themselves and try and uh, accumulate enough resources to push back. And that's going to take a year or so. So we could be seeing, after a year of, of missed opportunities and, and squandered opportunities, a year of consolidation. And I think the problem for the Ukrainians is the Russians have more resources to draw on. They've militarized their economy. Uh, they can draw on, it seems, a limitless supply of, of, of men. At the moment, there's no political fallout for that. I mean, it will come eventually, presumably, but f for now, the Russians have enough to draw. And so that balance of power might shift against Ukraine over the coming year. And that's that's a, a big challenge for the West, particularly in a year where we might see an American election deliver a president who seems to want, want to walk away from Ukraine and possibly abandon it. Of which more, more a little later in the, in the podcast, but just as regards U Ukraine, Michael, I mean, what, what is fascinating to me is that Vladimir Putin started this special military operation slash war, mm. thinking that it would be over in a matter of days. His actions of late would suggest, to me at least, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Vladimir Putin's in this for the long haul now, isn't he? Absolutely. He, I mean, his whole position depends on it, and his, his place in history, which is what he's, he's competing for. Mm. He, wants, he wants his place in history alongside Stalin, Peter the Great, and Catherine the Great. It all depends on it, and he's prepared to sacrifice any number of lives for that. The Russians know that they can't come back with a strategic offensive until the spring of 2025. So why, why so long? The spring of 20 because they um, they're gearing up their artillery production. So they're looking to to produce three million artillery shells a year, but not until 2025 when they'll be up there. They depend on North Korean shells and Ukra uh, Iranian shells at the moment. They've had a million shells from North Korea in three months. Whilst the Europeans have promised a million shells to Ukraine, they've only delivered 300,000 and have said, oh, we can't possibly deliver a million. I thought we promised it. Of course, we promised it, but we can't do it. Um, and so the Ukrainians are facing this problem where they've got to survive for 2024. The Russians will just keep at it for 2024 and then try to come back in the winter to spring of 2025 when their, their war economy should start to show some strategic strength, which they don't have at the moment. <clears throat> so in one sense, 2024 could be an opportunity for the Ukrainians if they were properly equipped to actually win back some of the territory. But equally, if they're not properly equipped and they can't reorganize themselves, then it's a very dangerous time indeed. Because I suppose for President Zelensky, Don, you know, stalemate is, is, is not a stalemate in, in these circumstances. If the Ukrainians mm. simply stay where they are, that provides, as, as Michael was saying, the opportunity for the Russians to get back into back to full fighting strength because they are they are stronger than yeah. the Ukrainians, aren't they? I mean, it's just a it's just a statement of fact. Yeah, and the um, it's a big debate, isn't there, about whether it's a stalemate or not? Yeah, yeah, Stalemate's yeah. more kind of what I think was happening in the trenches in 1914. Yeah, it's yeah. not like that. It's not really like that. But there's not much movement on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. There is a naval on naval uh, areas in in the Black Sea, and that might might change. And I think ch things might change on the battlefield a bit more quickly, but not in a strategically dramatic sense. That's, that's it's a, I think it's a bit like uh, playing Risk or Monopoly to, yeah, to, to yeah. draw on a festive illusion where well, you've I'm, got to the point where everyone's sort of, you've gone hell for leather to get all the properties you, you want to get hold of. Mm -hmm. One side holds Mayfair and Park Lane, I think it is, and the other one Bond Street and, and Oxford Street. And then you sort of dig in, you, you, you sort of sit there and wait for the, the cash to build up and then then you go for it at the end. And I think both sides are kind of doing that now. Mm. So it's not stalemate, it's in a, in a holding position. But ultimately the Russians do have the edge, which is why Zelensky, is in America, or has been in America this week, lobbying, begging for more um, support. At the same time, we've seen Putin in Moscow toasting the fact that Ukraine is, uh, in his words, losing Western support. Two years in, he's feeling confident enough uh, to run for re-election and to toast the demise of Ukraine. And you can see why he's confident. At the moment, you've, there's a severe doubt as to whether the Americans will carry on supporting the Ukrainians 
uh, whereas there's no doubt at all over Putin's ability as a totalitarian dictator to carry on, you know, pumping out shells and pouring men into the meat grinder. But the, there is one sort of caveat to that. I mean, I absolutely agree. That war economy, they're, they're moving now to a war economy. But next year, for the first time, the Russian public will feel it because the Rus Russia is now spending three times more on the military than it was spending before the war started in 2021. 300% increase. And they're now cutting, they're spending $156 billion on defence and security for next year. Mm -hmm. And they're now cutting down on welfare, education, health. So for the first time next year, the Russian public will start paying for this war in ways that they haven't so far. Now, th there's no obvious way in which their discontent will be felt, but, or at least will be expressed, mm -hmm. but it will be there. Just a yes, no from both of you. Does Vladimir Zelensky right now have a, a, a still stand a chance of winning this war? Dom? Yeah, I think it's a chance, but I think it'll, it, it takes it needs the West to wake up to mm -hmm. the threat to his uh, situation. I think the longer it goes on, the more strains there are within the Ukrainian mm -hmm. government, the stronger Russia could get. Michael, Beaton. yeah, I mean, the Ukrainians are capable ultimately of throwing the Russians out of the territory they seized in February 2022 and maybe a bit more. They're capable of doing that, mm -hmm. um, but they won't do it easily. And it's a bit like, you know, we think back to long wars. The Second World War, from the, the Allies' point of view, was, was lost, 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 lost until October 1942 and then victory, 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 victory right through to 1945. These things go in in great pendulum swings. It won't be as straightforward as that this time, but you can see we've got to think in terms of pendulum swings. The United States and China. And the big event that I suppose we should be fixating on on the horizon in the United States, the next presidential election, could it be Donald Trump? Um, it could. And at the moment, it looks likely that um, he would beat Joe Biden if you look at the polls, yeah. uh, which is astonishing to people looking in at America. This is a man who, in many people's minds, tried to engineer a, uh, a coup, um, a seizure of power after losing the election. And, um, and, and up. Up in front of the court, and goodness knows how many charges at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Four, four cases, two of which are likely to uh, come up in March, which would then obviously have, have an extraordinary impact on the electoral calendar as well. And I think it's the Washington one, the January the 6th one, but also the, uh, the porn star hush money case as well that could come up in, that will come up in, in March. Both of those are a threat to uh, Donald, uh, Donald Trump. And I think the fact is the, the extraordinary sort of perverse logic of the way American polit politics are is that he's a man who presents himself as a kind of the, the victim in chief. And the more of more he is a victim of the establishment of the state, of, of the prosecutors, the stronger he seems to do uh, electorally. Now, that, that I think that's restricted to sort of the 30 percent base that he has. Beyond that, it's more of a more of a question mark. But there is also a huge question mark over Joe Biden. Well, huge. Uh, just huge. the bottom line is that, you know, economies win or lose um, elections in America and Americans just don't feel for all the benefits that have come economically through the Biden administration and, and term in office. They're not feeling those benefits. And also they do feel that he is simply too old. So, so all those acts against Biden, which means he is in a difficult position. It's almost too late to replace him. So I think we're looking at a, an interesting election next year. Michael, I mean, what, 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 what would the re-election of Donald Trump mean, not just for, for the war in Ukraine, but for NATO? Oh, I think NATO will self-destruct if um, Trump is elected. Everyone says, oh, Trump might pull America out of NATO and NATO will collapse. NATO will self-destruct before that. Yeah. Because if Trump is elected, <clears throat> then southern and east European countries will start doing their own deals with Russia in anticipation. So Hungary will, under present management. Romania will, under present management. Slovakia will, under present management. The Serbs, who are not part of NATO, will certainly do deals. Mm -hmm. They strengthen their deals. So Italy will do a deal, under present management. The French will talk grand thing. They'll talk about grand architecture that nobody will mm -hmm. understand. And the Germans will go back to doing what they do best, which is dithering. And what you'll end up with is a, a, a NATO based on Northern Europe, in which Britain might feature quite largely, but it will yeah. be a rump NATO based on what these days is called the Joint Expeditionary Force, or GEF, which are the Scandinavian countries who are very fierce about this, Poland, the Baltic States, the Netherlands, Denmark. And you have this northern group of countries, maybe with Canada, who will try to hold things together, but they won't have the strength to do so. So the election of a Donald Trump uh, next November would be disastrous for Europe and I wish I could be more optimistic. I wish I could say that the Europeans will take up the slack. They'll say it. They'll say all the right things, but they just won't do it. Not just for Europe. And it's disastrous for the free world, for the Western yeah. alliance. Um, we're, we're moving in. I mean, you know, I, I keep thinking this, and I, I, I think I've just got to say it. We are moving into an era, a new dark age mm. of dictatorship and gangsterism. And in that dark age, the right wing of the Republican Party, the Make America Great Again crowd, they like the idea of a Putin victory because they think that in this new dark age, 
relations, global relations will be dominated by the relationship between three dictators, Trump, Putin and Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And those three will allocate what happens in the world. The rest of us are, will have to get used to that idea. That's what attracts them to this idea of a Trump, Xi, Putin triumvirate, which will somehow organize this new dark age. Just just a word then from you, Dom, on, on President Xi and, and, and China's ambitions. I mean, th they will continue to expand in 2024. And Taiwan is, is a word that I expect to come up again and again. Yeah, and, and we have a key election coming up in Taiwan as well. And of I course. think the bottom line for China is if, if you end up with a government in Taiwan who who wants to go uh, for, for independence, that they've made it pretty clear that's, that's the red line. I think the good news with China is like a year ago, we were saying that... Um, there was no communication at all. Diplomacy had died between China and America, which was a t terrifying prospect because of the possibility of miscalculation, misunderstanding, leading to um, an escalation that could end up with a very difficult situation, kind of a cold war becoming a hot war. But I, we do have diplomacy now. Again, they are talking both sides, but there still seems to be the momentum within both Beijing and in Washington, rhetorically at least, towards the kind of the, the idea that eventually there will be some kind of conflict. And that's hard to sort of talk your talk your, your way ab away from in the end. Mm. I mean, the 2020s are the mid 2020s are going to be a very dangerous decade. As Dom says, if we can get through it. I mean, if the United States and China can come to a sort of a modus operandi for the next 50 or 60 years by 2030, then there's an organizing device that the rest of the world can fit around. But if it can't, and Taiwan may be the critical mm -hmm. point because Xi Jinping has said he will settle Taiwan while he is in power, and that takes you to 2027, 2028, something like that. Um, if they can't, then that's very dangerous indeed. So I think we're going through a very dangerous period the next few years. If we get through it, then pragmatism and maybe new leaderships post-Trump and so on may actually give us a, a, a more hopeful horizon. Well, we will see, won't we? Uh, Michael? Dominic, always a pleasure to have you in the podcast studio. And that is your lot for this special edition of the Sky News Daily. You can find much, much more on, on any of the topics that we were discovering. Uh, just scroll back through the podcast feed and you'll find plenty of input uh, from Michael and, of course, from Dom. Uh, but that is it for this edition. We will see you next time.